Hello, Internet! I'm Alec the Purple Ardufus, and welcome to Buddy Reads, where I read a small selection of a book and review it for you. Today we are covering chapters 11 and 12 of Artemis by Andy Weir. I hope you've read up to that point because I do not want to ruin anything for you. Where we left off yesterday, the Queen of Artemis had a gun pointed at Jazz. And she was like, ha ha ha, you found me out. How did you do it? And Jazz was like, it was a simple process of elimination. All the other suspects are dead. <laughs> I just don't understand why. The queen says, well, the great thing about Artemis was that people were coming here and they were spending their entire life savings to be here. But the sad thing about Artemis now is that the population is starting to top off. We are having to let less and less people in. Jazz is like, I don't understand. What are you saying? And the queen says, Artemis is going broke. We are running out of money. So I concocted this scheme to have Zappho made here on Artemis. It'll create jobs. We can sell Zappho for trillions of dollars and Artemis can thrive forever. Jazz is kind of like, but how did the guys know that I I put my gizmo in the middle of city square. She's like, I told him. And Jess is like, you're kind of a bitch, aren't you? She's like, yes, but I am also the mayor slash governor slash president of Artemis. So I'm doing what's best for Artemis. And Jess is like, oh, screw you too. And she leaves. She initially goes back to her hiding place and she's reading over reports and she feels some water on her arm. She's like, that's odd. I shouldn't feel water. And she looks up and she's like feeling the ceiling that she's under and she's like, that's not even wet. What, what am I feeling? What? Oh, oh God. Oh. And she's like, oh, I am crying. Oh. I am such a weak little girl. And she's like, oh, I just really need sleep. So she goes to Sabota's. And Sabota opens the door and she comes in and she's like, I just need to pass out. Please let me pass out on your floor, please. And Sabota's like, oh, you can take the bed. I'll take the floor. And she's like, oh, I just need a... I just need floor. I just, uh, I need, uh, please. And Sabota says, trust me, you'll be much more comfortable on my bed. She says, I don't need your bed. Uh, and she falls over and passes out. She then wakes up with a pillow and a blanket. And she realizes that after she had passed out on the floor, Sabota had actually moved her to the bed and taken off her shoes and put a blanket on top of her. She's like, oh, what a gentleman. I should probably do something to uh, say thank you. Maybe I could cook him breakfast. A nice meal? Maybe a movie? Maybe I could sleep with him. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. But then she decides to sit down with Sabota and tell him everything that the queen told her. And he's like, wow, that's really heavy stuff. What are you going to do about it? And she's like, I'm going to finish the job that I initially started. We are going to destroy the factory that is making the oxygen and everything. One of the reasons that the Hispanic slash Mexican slash Spanish guy was after her was because she was going against the mob and the mob was on its way to Artemis to create the Zappho, you know, have a mob empire on the moon. The queen was trying to, she wasn't trying to stop that, but she was just kind of saying, I don't want those people here, but I still want the money. Jazz's plan is to destroy the factory so that the mob has nothing to build off of. And all of the jobs and everything have to be, cre be created with the people on Artemis. She then decides that she needs some massive crew and she goes to visit with L Lane? L Lene? L Oh, I don't know how to pronounce names. Forgive me. <laughs> she goes to visit with Tron's daughter, who is mourning his death. She asks Tron's daughter to help her to finish the job, and Tron's daughter has this watch that he had, and she says, you know, this was a beautiful watch. It was made specifically for the moon. It even has the different phases of the earth. It's just an amazing, amazing watch. And now, and she puts it on her wrist and puts her hands down in the the watch just kind of floats to the ground. She's like, it's it's too big for me. While Jazz is trying to convince her to help her, she fixes the watch and puts it back on Lan's arm. And it fits. And she's like, will you help me? And Lan's like, yes. 
Guess I will help you. Then we finally get another letter between her and Kelvin. Only this one isn't in the past. This one is in the present. And it basically runs down everything that happened. And she says, I need schematics for the factory. Can you get those for me? Of whatever you need to pay to get those, I will pay you. And he writes back and he says, this feels like heavy shit that's going down. Of course I will help you. And he gives her all the schematics and he's like, it was really easy to get. All I had to do was get this guy drunk with a couple beers. So it'll only cost you like 50 slugs. And she says, well, I'm sending you 75. Have a beer on me. Then we have my favorite part of any heist story, which is odd because it's usually at the beginning of the heist story, and this is practically two-thirds in. She amasses her crew at Hartnell's, and she collects Bob, the Marine, Dale, her ex's boyfriend, Leanne, Sabota, and finally her father. And her father comes in, and he sees all the people, and he sees Bob, and he's like, oh, you're a human. And he sees Leanne, and he's like, oh, I am so sorry for your loss. I knew Tron personally. He was a great man. He's just like, thank you. He goes to Sabota, and he's like, well, you're strange. And then he goes to Dale, and he's like, fuck you. And Dale's like, is it because I'm Jewish or because I'm gay? And her dad's like, it's because you hurt my daughter, you ass. And Dale is like, well, that answers that question. And they all sit down, and Jazz decides to lay out the plan for them. And she says, we need a portable shelter. We're going to drag it over to the factory. I will secure it to the factory, and then I will work my way into it from the side and blow up their smeltering unit, which creates the aluminum and the glass. It's not quite the harvester that I was supposed to blow up, but it's still the same job. And everyone's like, okay, we're all on board. The one thing that I didn't really like about this part was Dale was like, okay, I'll do this, but then you can't be mad at me anymore. And I'm, I'm like, that, that's not how that works. You either, you, you can't just stop being mad at someone. You can't, that, no, no, that's, that's not how human emotion works. He doesn't really have anything. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't really have any leverage there, but she accepts it, and it's just like, no, no, no. Dale brings over a portable shelter, and her dad starts welding into the portable shelter. Jazz is watching over him, and she says, why is it taking you so long? I've seen you do this in like 45 minutes. And he's like, it's a process. Let me do my process. She's like, I don't understand, though. I've seen you do this too you know, with one hand tied behind your back in 15 minutes, what's going on? And he said, just let me do my process. And she's like, what? but it's so easy. I've seen you do it a hundred times. What's going on? And then she realizes, she realizes what's going on. Her father is taking his time because if he fucks this up, she dies. He is doubling down on her safety by his welding this compartment for her. And I read that part and I'm like, I'm not gonna cry! I'm not gonna cry! Oh god, I'm gonna cry! Oh man, I'm gonna cry so hard! <laughs> so heartwarming! Uh, she then sits down with Sabota and they are discussing their plans and he's like, there's just one thing that really bugs me. This part where you're about to cut into, there are methane tanks like right there. And she's like, extra boom, perfect. And he's like, yeah, but I just don't like extra variables. This kind of scares me, creeps me out. And she says, don't worry, we'll take care of it. It's kind of a touching moment. It's not nearly as touching her and her dad, but you know, he's like, just be careful out there. And she's like, okay. And he's like, have you had sex yet? And I'm like, come on. Dude, read the room! What the hell? <laughs> Then we have her and Dale, and they are dragging the portable shelter across the moon. And there's some explanations about how the oxygen line is just right on top of the moon's lair, because most people wouldn't be out there. It really wasn't thought of as something that could be a hazard at all. And I have a feeling that might bite us later, but it doesn't bite us now. And they get the trailer or portable compartment to the other side of the factory. And that is pretty much where the section ends. Yeah. I probably missed a lot, <laughs> but yeah, that, that moment with, with her and her father was just a little whoo, too much for me. And then like I started watching TV and it was like every touching commercial, was, <laughs> which is really difficult now in the holidays. <laughs> like, mm, I'm not going to cry. <laughs> going to cry a lot. If you like what I'm doing, go ahead and click the subscribe button. If you like this video specifically, go ahead and click that like button and go ahead and leave a comment letting me know what your favorite touching moment is. I've been Elliot the Purple Air Doofus. This has been Buddy Reads reminding you to watch a gym radius. And I will see you all in the next section of Artemis by Andy Weir. Toodles! <laughs>